Welcome, friends. Uh, another IOX conversation. My uh, guest today uh, is Professor uh, Geraint uh, Lewis from the University of Sydney's Institute of Astronomy. Welcome back, Geraint. Thank you for inviting me. It's good to, to have you back. Um, last time uh, we had a chat, uh, we had this uh, beautiful conversation, very insightful from my viewpoint in relation to uh, uh, fine tuning, which is uh, uh, your uh, uh, turf, your, your field of study, or one of them anyway, one of your uh, interests. And um, I think uh, we left it somehow, I mean, our conversation, we, we left it uh, in suspension. Uh, and so what prompted me uh, to extend another invitation uh, is not only my sense of uh, uh, an unfinished business, uh, but it's also uh, the fact that uh, just a few days ago, uh, as I uh, said in our um, uh, email exchange, uh, I watched a documentary on, uh, I think it was on Curiosity Stream, uh, in 2019 or so documentary, and you were, you featured there. It was on uh, uh, Alien Life. Uh, and uh, you had two uh, wonderful interventions there, but by the way, a, a very interesting uh, documentary. And I thought, wow, this is it. We have to return to, uh, to our, uh, where we left our uh, discussion and, uh, and see what uh, uh, we can make of it. Now, fine tuning, I, I think uh, uh, people who are, uh, are interested in further details uh, can uh, profitable, profitably uh, read uh, 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 your book on, on it, you know, uh, the uh, uh, fortunate universe, uh, they can also uh, contact you. I, I understand you, you love being contacted by uh, people with all sorts of ideas. Yeah. And uh, <laughs> like me. <laughs> and, uh, and of course, uh, uh, they can uh, they can watch your own uh, uh, YouTube channel, um, uh, Alas, uh, Lewis and Barnes. Um, now, before we roll the ball, I think, um, I should uh, say a few words about, uh, uh, about my thinking. So we live in a fortunate universe, to use your, uh, your phrase. And it is fortunate in that um, we exist. Uh, and it, it seems that uh, regardless of what we believe or not uh, about uh, some uh, supernatural uh, agency that uh, might have or not uh, uh, made things the way uh, uh, they are so that we can actually uh, exist. Uh, we are fortunate. We are fortunate to live in this universe, to be here and to be able to talk about such matters. Uh, and uh, I wonder uh, if uh, uh, this fortune is something that somehow privileges us, human beings living in this uh, uh, beautiful uh, uh, blue planet, uh, lost in the immensity of, uh, of space, or is it something that favors life, whatever in whatever form, uh, in um, various other regions of, uh, of space? Uh, this is a, a topic that uh, um, interests uh, even Orthodox theologians more and more. Uh, and um, um, recently I, I, I have uh, um, uh, had the honor uh, of reading and giving some feedback uh, um, to a, uh, a chapter, book chapter uh, by Ted Peters from um, uh, Berkeley. And um, Although he's uh, he's not Orthodox himself, he's a Lutheran theologian. Uh, he has written a, a chapter on how Orthodox theology might fare uh, in regard to um, uh, astrobiology uh, and uh, alien life. Uh, so this discussion is important. Uh, uh, it's a ranging uh, discussion, and before uh, I impose on you, which isn't my uh, uh, my intention. Uh, any kind of agenda. Uh, let's see how this uh, conversation unfolds and where it leads us. So, is it fortune? Uh, is it our fortune, uh, or it might be a fortunate universe for 
many other life forms? So, so that, that's, that's a really good question. So as you mentioned, I've been very um, interested in this question of fine tuning and life across what's known as the multiverse, right? So, and what we find is that most universes are uh, sterile effectively. You can't get life in them. And what that means is you can't get complexity, right? We are built out of 92 natural elements, et cetera. If you don't have those elements, if the universe was simply hydrogen, you wouldn't be it. One of the questions we get asked a lot though is, you know, if we are in a fortunate universe, does that mean that our universe is um, friendly for life? Is it, um, is it bi biophilic? Would that be the right word? Yes, you know what I, what I mean. Is, is that, should we expect life to be commonplace in our universe? And, you know, this is a, this is a big question that there have been a lot, of, a lot of focus on in the last couple of decades, firstly through the, the fact that we now know of roughly 5,000 planets outside of our own solar system. And you know, if you extrapolate the numbers, then there are more planets than stars. And we already know that there are more stars than there are grains of sand on all the beaches in all the world, right? So there's lots of planets out there. And this entire topic of astrobiology has now grown up in the sense that if there are planets out there, then what's the prospect for life? And of course, since the 1950s, 1960s, et cetera, people have been scanning the skies, looking for signals from other civilizations. But the, the, the question is, is that even though there are a lot of planets, does that mean that the steps that took place on our planet um, from which life arose, are they, are they universal? Or is there something privileged about this world in the sense that um, we, we are not in a, a random bit of universe here. We are in a place where life can exist and we should not be surprised to find ourselves here. And so there's, there's been a long running discussion about essentially where we would expect life to arise. And it turns out that um, whilst we don't know the mechanism, people have got lots of ideas about what you need. And it turns out that Earth would be seemingly um, rare in the, the possibilities of planets. It has the right kinds of conditions where life could be. Um, and then, you know, even if life itself might not be that rare, I mean, what everyone talks about when they talk about life is not pond scum or amoeba, right? What we want to talk about is aliens, intelligent beings who we could converse with and ask these questions of them about what's their worldview of the universe, etc. And to, to cut to the chase from for my side of things, I think what, what all the evidence is showing is that uh, that whilst life itself might not be super rare in the universe, uh, intelligent life, right? Life that can ponder its place in the universe is almost vanishingly rare. And you know, there are a number of things that we can talk about that, that leads to this conclusion, which again, I think, um, you know, as human beings, we should take time and reflect upon, right? I mean, if we, if we are, the only intelligent species in our galaxy, that's already you know, pretty scary. If we're the only intelligent creature in our observable universe, then that's something that we should be proud of. And as a, as a species, you know, we, we should be nurturing, but we seem to be going the other way. Mm, yeah, look at Ukraine. <laughs> yes. In other places. Yes. Mm. Yeah. So my, my uh uh, my interest in, in uh, addressing this topic uh, with you comes from the fact that you believe in fine tuning. And I, I have uh, read some, uh, your books. Uh, I'm yet to come to uh, specialized articles uh, uh, because I think they are far above my uh, pay grade uh, and competence, but who knows? Uh, I have listened to you and so on and so forth. And you seem to 
to understand this or to be able to draw this conclusion that uh, fine tuning somehow makes life unavoidable. Uh, regardless of how much we, uh, we understand uh, the mechanisms of uh, life generation on earth, uh, if we place this discussion of uh, our genesis, our uh, emergence as uh, uh, not only as a human species, but as life on earth, uh, in, against this broader backdrop of, of the universe, a uh, fine tuned universe, uh, we might expect that uh, regardless of uh, our capabilities um, uh, to discover or not life in the near future, life elsewhere that is, uh, we should expect to find it given that we live in this fine-tuned universe, this fortunate universe as you call it, isn't it? Uh, yes, so, so let, let me put it let me put it this way, like I'm not, gonna, I'm not gonna be as bold to declare that life is inevitable everywhere else, but my sort of line of thinking is the following, right? Um, we know that we have our 92 natural elements in the periodic table, and we know that they can join together in various kinds of ways. And when we look at inter interstellar clouds, we see waters, we see alcohol, we see very complicated molecules, etc. And at some level, right, we have to live with the fact that we are a molecular machine, right? We are run by molecules interacting in complex ways. And so even if you've got a planet which has just got simple, simple in quotes there, you know, simple structures, right? You'd expect there to be complicated things happening in terms of the, the chemistry because those building blocks are there. Right, it's like you know, it, you you can um, you can take Lego and build lots of interesting things, but without the Lego, you you can't do anything. So there would be processes that um, arise, even on a lifeless planet, that would you know involve things like replication, etc. We find you know chemists find this is that molecules can replicate themselves. The I guess the issue is 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 um, at the moment, there is no dividing line between, you know, what is alive and what isn't alive, right? We just know that there's this um, growing sort of spectrum of complexity. And over here, we've got a bacterium and we say, oh, that's alive. Over here, we've got warm mud in a pool and we go, oh, that's not alive. But the boundary region is, is a little bit fuzzy, right? It's a little bit fuzzy, you know, and there's this question of, um, uh, viruses are viruses alive now they're quite complicated viruses but you know you go down a level to prions which are basically misshaped protons uh, protons proteins um, and they reproduce and they reproduce inside us etc but they are proteins and so they're really just complicated molecules so where's the line so I, you know I, I, I would think that on a lot of planets you could get the environment where you could get complexity giving you complex processes whether or not we'd want to call it life because you know we I, we have a very um we tend to have a very narrow viewpoint of what life is right i mean we live here on this planet we talk about life and sometimes you forget that all the plants are actually alive as well and then you get to the the, the fungi they're alive and then you get down into the bacterial world and you know this is where well, i can't remember where i read this right you know this is a bacterial planet right it's a single cell planet and we are going along for the ride we are not the dominant life on this planet by any any stretch right um and we i guess we kind of forget that that's where a lot of the life is down there in in the stuff that we don't see and don't really consider and and, and makes our own machine work Absolutely. Um, again, I, I, I'm a bit of a fan of, um, you know, evolutionary biology and the, this notion that our, our cells in our body, right, um, started off in the long distance past as single cells. But over time, you know, they get to stick together, but they, they brought friends on board, right? So mitochondria inside our cells, the things responsible for the energy that keeps us going, they were separate things that existed and 
you know, got into a symbiotic relationship inside ourselves. And that kind of story that, that you know, e even in the evolutionary picture, you know, that makes things very, very messy indeed, right? So, you know, where, where was the genesis of that and that? And when did they come together? And when does it become complex life that we, we understand? Um, I, 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 um, I agree with you and uh, um, yeah, I think our definition of life, if there's any uh, single definition of, of life that uh, is satisfactory, uh, uh, needs uh, amendment. Uh, I, I haven't found yet one that, uh, that satisfies, I don't know, some strict criteria that uh, we think, okay, so this is uh, the only thing that uh, uh, might uh, lead to the conclusion that it's something is alive or not. Um, now, it's uh, something that bothers me, may, maybe more science fiction than, than, uh, than uh, science. Um, it's usually a, a discussion that uh, uh, unfolds in relation to uh, the anthropic principle, you know, the various formulations, but to cut to the chase for the viewers, uh, it's the idea that there is a connection between our existence as, as human beings uh, and the universe and its parameters from age to size to uh, composition and so on and so forth. Uh, could we extend the anthropic principle? Of course, it, it's, it's no longer anthropic. Uh, it's biotic, say, <laughs> yeah. the biotic principle. Can we extend it and, and say that there is a connection between this fine-tuned, fortunate universe and the existence of life? I, I'm still uh, what I try to 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 uh, to uh, squeeze out of, uh, of of your wisdom is this idea that uh, life, okay, so not uh, unavoidable the way we understand life, but but life might be, hopefully must be uh, very widespread, regardless of how we define life, and that this has something to do with uh, with the fine tuned universe. Can, can we speak? At least theorizing, can we speak of a uh, of a universe uh, which is fine tuned uh, and it is fine tuned for uh, for life, and therefore there's some kind of connection between life here and elsewhere, and uh, the parameters of the universe. Yes, so there's actually two aspects to this that you that we we need to consider, right? So again, um, the anthropic principle uh, is really a complexity principle, right? Can we have complexity? In, in a universe. That's what a anthropic principle boils down to. And yes, we know we have that complexity throughout our universe. So that, that side of things, I, th I think, you know, as long as the laws of physics over there are the same as the laws of physics over here, then it's the same thing governing the, the prospects for life in terms of the physical laws. The thing that we have come to realize is the, um, nature versus nurture kind of question for the universe in the sense that um what well, if we go back right you know um back to the um copernicus right let's go back and and and, and let's play the the game that's uh, that we understand from copernicus of course copernicus moved the earth from the center of the universe and put the sun there right and so sort of downgraded the earth somewhat right so we were we we're just a planet like the other planets and of course, modern astronomy has played this game of downgrading the sun. It's just a star in the galaxy. And our galaxy, it isn't special, et cetera. So, so this being this constant sort of, you know, you know, you're more and more irrelevant when it comes to the universe. But what sort of happened over the last century as well, there was a number of, you know, physicists, uh, Dirac and Eddington uh, and Dickey, et cetera, who sort of realized that the, that this raw version of the Copernican principle um, can't really hold, right? So the Copernican principle boils down to that, you know, we're at on a random planet in a random part of the universe and the view should be the same everywhere else and we're not special, etc. But at some level, we are, we are privileged in the sense that um, in terms of time in the universe, we. We couldn't have existed at any random time, right? We clearly couldn't have existed before the first stars, right? So that already wipes out, you know, a couple of hundred million years at the start of the universe. And in 
timescales of 10 to 100 trillion years, the stars will burn out. Now, there's a lot of universe after that point to infinity, but there are no stars. And so the notion that we could survive in that future universe sort of goes out the window. So we, we're in a big window of time, right? Um, but we're in a privileged window. And we can also ask the question about our location in space, right? When we look at the environment that you could find yourself in, right? As I mentioned, they're, they're, the planets are uncountable, but where are they? So they're going around stars. So where are the stars? The stars are in galaxies. In the middle of our Milky Way galaxy, right? The density of stars is really high and uh, there are violent close encounters between stars. And it's thought that the inner region of our um, galaxy is not a good place for life, right? And essentially what I mean by that is what you want for life to be long lived is you want a long stable environment and you don't get that environment if every you know few million years, your star and another star come close together and have an, have an interaction. It's too, uh, too much violence there. It, exactly. Like exactly. in Ukraine, too many like, Russians. Yeah. <laughs> and then when we go to the outer edge of the galaxy, it, it has the opposite problem. It has been just too quiescent. So, you know, the, uh, the outside of the galaxy is like, you know, a seaside town in Britain, right? It, it's running at a different rate of time. Things just go slowly. So it hasn't built up the chemicals, right, that we would expect to be available when a star forms to form a planetary disk. So we have a window in our galaxy, a spatial window, can't get too close to the center, don't want to be too far to the outside. And of course, what, what, what we have is what we call a habitable zone. Yeah, another Goldilocks zone. A Goldilocks zone. And of course, we bring that all the way down to individual um, planets inside a solar system. What we have, of course, is that the Earth is in the region where it's not too close to the sun to, uh, to basically get its atmosphere burnt away, not too far away for it to be frozen. And so you have to bring all these factors in when you start to play this game of, okay, there's lots of planets, there might be lots of opportunity for complexity, but what about the conditions for life? And there, there, there was a well-known book written, oh, it must be more than 20 years ago now, called The Rare Earth Hypothesis by Ward and Brownlee. And they basically go through the, um, the facts about this planet, which we don't really think about. We, we sort of think, oh, what we've got here is probably universal. And so uh, we'll, we'll just extrapolate and life could be everywhere. But we, th we have lots of conditions on Earth which are not necessarily true for lots of other planets. We have a, a star that has been burning stably for roughly 5 billion years. Its brightness is you now slowly getting brighter, but on timescales of billions of years. Other stars, their brightness can vary by 100 or 1,000 on timescales of weeks or months. As you can imagine, in those systems, um, prospects of life on a planet are going to be pretty rough because you know, the, the, the sunlight just keeps changing. One of the other things that really um, I find kind of interesting about the Earth, and, and I'll mention this, it, I, I was speaking to a geologist a while ago, and they had given me a piece of rock, a big chunk of rock, right? And it was rippled, okay? And he says, this is a fossilized beach from three and a half billion years ago, okay? So, you know, found in Australia, oldest rocks, etc. And those ripples come from the tide, right? The water comes in, water comes out. So you, you, we're all happy with the tide. We know, we know how the oceans work. And we also know that on the earth, it's currently 70% ocean and 30% land. It used to be more in the very early years of the earth. We were, were effectively a water world. But they, they now sort of have come to the conclusion that for life, to start generating these cycles, one of the important things is not just water, but the ability to get something wet and then to dry it, right? So you have these wet in, dry in cycles. And you can only do that in an environment where firstly you have land. So if, if we had twice the amount of ocean, 
Right? No, no more land. Okay. And of course, we could go the other way and we could have been a desert planet. We, we don't understand exactly why we have the amount of water we do. So you, you need this sort of action of uh, water wetting chemicals and drying chemicals. But of course, that motion is driven by the presence of the moon. And, you know, the uh, other planets in the solar system, like Venus, does not have a moon. Venus would not have tides in the same way that the Earth has tides. Mars has got two tiny potatoes for moons, right? So, you know, we're now asking the question, well, if that wetting and drying cycle and the amount of water is important and the presence of a large moon, then, you know, your probability of finding another planet with, a, with similar circumstances diminishes quite rapidly. So this is why they call it the rare, rare Earth hypothesis. And again, one of the other things that the moon does, it, it keeps the north point in north and the south point in south. So we spin, right? But that spin is not stable in the sense that it gets perturbations. And the Earth should be able to tip upside down. Right? Okay, tip upside down. Now, you, you can imagine how catastrophic that would be, right? If that happened, not from everybody just going, oh, but you know, what, what would it do to the climate if everything had to readjust and all the winds had to change, et cetera? It would be pretty harsh. So we, I, what, we are, what we end up doing is, is we end up saying that if we bring in this anti-Copernican sort of idea, then the, the locations for life in the universe become less and less and less, especially for complex life. Maybe simple life doesn't really care where north and south is and can survive that kind of thing. Um, but complex life probably is not advantageous. Mm, like the flat earthers. Uh, I, I was reading the other day uh, something. Uh, they had a convention in Birmingham uh, and, uh, uh, and they decided that Australia doesn't exist. Uh, and uh, we are all actors. Uh, from the northern hemisphere, well, the only hemisphere actually, uh, and we just uh, uh, play a, a role, you know, to uh, uh, fool the the poor uh, uh, northerners uh, to believe that uh, the, uh, the Earth is round. Yeah. So imagine that if we had, uh, if the the tilt of <laughs> of of the Earth would be so dramatic that uh, south becomes north and the other way around. So. Uh, we might be marginal. We aren't in the center of uh, of the solar system. We are in the center of the galaxy, but uh, there's no center to the universe to speak of, and th therefore we are, by all intents and purposes, marginal. But this, as you call it, uh, an anti-Copernican uh, principle makes life possible, and therefore uh, we return to a thesis in your in your book. We are indeed fortunate, and and this shows that the very fact of our existence shows that all that kind of uh, where's the center, where's the, the periphery, doesn't mean anything when it comes to uh, uh, this uh, uh, fortunate circumstance of being alive. Yeah. <laughs> yes, yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, I'm just trying to, trying to work out exactly what, the, what I should be addressing in that statement, right? Um, it, it's... In terms of us in the universe, we should not be surprised to find ourselves around a stable star, star in a habitable zone um, with a large moon and 50% water in a habitable zone in the galaxy, but in a fine tuned universe that allows all of that to be there. And again, if you were, if you, if you were a betting man, right, you, know, the, you, suddenly, you suddenly start playing the odds game and you sort of go, wow, it is kind of lucky for us to be here. We might be exceedingly rare, but clearly we are, we're not a zero probability. And of course, then the question does arise, uh, are there sites where complex life could thrive? Are there, and again, I, I'm, I'm not gonna use the phrase other Earths because there are probably other factors that would provide stability and that kind of thing. But are there other, planetary systems out there where if life got a foothold complexity could arise and you you get to a situation where there would be life forms on that planet and you know as i mentioned i i i have a very wide um 
probability window on that. I, I mean, I go all the way down to life can be very, very, very rare, or life might be relatively common as long as it's simple life. So that's, I think that's the, the, the key place where I, 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 I put myself, but it's the notion of intelligent life. I think that all these factors come into play. Yeah. Well, uh, I, I assume uh, the same kind of uh, thinking determined uh, Isaac Asimov uh, in, uh, uh, in the Foundation series, the later volumes, uh, to postulate uh, along the lines of the anthropic principle that uh, uh, each galaxy is uh, roughly the nursery of, uh, uh, of one intelligent life form. Uh, yeah, as you said earlier, uh, this is a bit depressing to, uh, yeah. to think of the, of the fact that we might never encounter uh, uh, people, well, people, beings able to uh, uh, communicate with us in, in a form that we consider, commu uh, consider communication. But the thing is, uh, and uh, to go back to <laughs> Asimov, uh, he also postulated the fact that uh, the conditions that uh, uh, made possible life here, and he was very uh, strict with uh, uh, with uh, uh, all those elements uh, required by uh, by our existence in the solar system. Uh, but uh, uh, even in the absence of all those elements that made uh, possible, somehow conspired towards our existence, life is still possible in in many other places, in many other sites, uh, regardless of. Uh, how simple and how different from, from us uh, it, it might be. And uh, I think, because uh, uh, you mentioned earlier uh, your fondness for evolutionary uh, biology, uh, I'm very fond of it too. Uh, and uh, I'm aware of, uh, of the different schools of thought. Uh, I, for one, um, uh, put my money on um, uh, Stephen Jay Gould's uh, uh, idea that if we roll back uh, the history of life on Earth, and then we try to unroll it, uh, we might not find ourselves talking about it because <laughs> other beings might emerge along the way. And, and this, this leaves room for randomness. Uh, and again, uh, your concept of, uh, of being fortunate to be here. Uh, and I, I know many of my fellow believers uh, find this uh, thought troubling. And I, I, I want to say, I don't find it at all troubling. Uh, regardless of uh, how we look at the morphology of things, uh, the history of the cosmos, the history of life uh, on Earth uh, 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 or anywhere else, in reality, um, we can still maintain our faith, which don't, uh, I don't uh, intend to impose on you or anyone else. But, but uh, for believers, uh, our life can, uh, our, sorry, our faith can still be maintained uh, if we look at the fact that there is this chance, <laughs> I use deliberately the word, this chance uh, for us to be here. And regardless of how we consider uh, 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 our existence, our existence matters. Uh, it, it's, it's something, it's, it's, it's the product of, of something, all this um, uh, I don't know, convergence of uh, elements and energies and, and all that. And, uh, I repeat, regardless of what we believe, uh, if there's a God or not, uh, for us believers, there's still room to speak of, uh, of a God, even in such a uh, fortunate universe uh, uh, where life might uh, emerge uh, anywhere else. And even here, if it was about uh, rolling back the, uh, the scroll, uh, uh, we wouldn't be here and, and someone else would talk about these things instead of us, uh, perhaps hypothesizing our existence. Um, and I, I, I will just want to add one more thing. An analogy for believers. God, uh, insofar as uh, uh, he's our creator, uh, has created us free. What does freedom mean? There's room for randomness in our thinking, in our life choices, in our way of life, and so on and so forth. Uh, for instance, some believers that have just invaded Ukraine, well, a month or so ago, some believers yeah, consider that their God asks them to kill other people, to, to commit the genocide in the name of, I don't know what, ancestral mythology. Because uh, that, that's what uh, it all boils down to, uh, apart from uh, Putin's own uh, madness. Uh, 
that's a way of using freedom. Just imagine those people making a different choice because of their freedom. So randomness uh, uh, is something that for believers is God given. Well, how about uh, we relate freedom and uh, the freedom of choice uh, with uh, the more say ontological dimension, the very being uh, of uh, life and everything else on, on, uh, in the universe. Uh, the same kind of randomness is a gift of God. Uh, and this gift of God uh, uh, allows matter and energy and life to evolve and transform and so on and so forth. For me, that, that's no, no problem. It's a no brainer. Uh, and, and this is why regardless of what evolutionary biology might say or uh, uh, evolutionary cosmologists might say uh, about uh, uh, the history of things, um, I feel very much at home uh, with that kind of universe. Well, uh, yeah, well, well, as I said, look, I, I uh, as you know, I'm not a religious person, but I am a whatever gets you through the night kind of person. So, you know, your your beliefs for um, how you want to understand the universe, perfectly fine with me. But I'm, I'm going to take a slight step backwards here. So you talked about Stephen Jay Gould, you know, rerunning evolution. I was at a talk the other day. Uh, it was actually, it was held in the US. Paul Davis, who's a, you know, he writes science books, right? He's based in, in Arizona. But he had a special guest on uh, who's Charlie Lineweaver from um, uh, the Australian National University. And I've known Charlie for years. He has worked, done a lot of work on things like uh, habitable zones and galaxies, et cetera. And the question that, that came up was, is, is intelligence inevitable, right? So you talk about playing the tape forward again, and the assumption is that, oh, maybe it won't be us, but there will be another intelligent creature. And what Charlie said that, that really stuck with me is that you know, evolution has had a long time for intelligence to arise and it hasn't bothered, okay? It, the dinosaurs didn't really need it, okay? Most of mammals don't really need it. What you get is that there's one lineage, uh, you know, the apes, right? And only when you get to the higher apes and suddenly you find us. So in the tree of life up here in a, in a distant corner, there is a, a creature that ponders itself. And if you take that randomness into account and you regrow the tree of life, it's not inevitable that that bud with intelligence will appear. It, it could, and it could have appeared 200 million years ago, right? There was nothing stopping the dinosaurs growing large brains. They, they, they had the ability, but evolutionary, they didn't have the need. And I guess that's one of the biggest questions that I have with regards to our own evolution as such, is what was it in our, um, in our development at some point in the last few million years that we suddenly needed a brain that was large enough that we get to this point where you know, we're sitting here talking over electronic devices, pondering the universe, right? What triggered that path? And how, how random was that trigger? Is it, you know, the, um, the idea of hypothetical, uh, you know, alternative history, right? You change one thing, the outcome is completely different. And I do wonder a little bit if there was one of those moments in our evolutionary history that click and we were on a path where our brains enlarge, et cetera. But alternatively, we could be sitting here today. Well, we, we wouldn't be us, of course. We'd be some sort of primate sitting in a forest, probably in Africa, because we wouldn't have left. Uh, and we wouldn't care about what was going on in the universe, because all we would care about is where's the next fruit coming from. So, so again, look, I have, a, I have a similar view of the role of randomness. Of course, my, my randomness is, uh, is tied to the natural world in just what's going on. Um, but yeah, I, I think it is important. But I, 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 I do think that it's something we have to ponder about why us. And, the, and again, I'm going to go. I, I'm so, that's sorry. interesting. Oh. Keep going. Keep going. It's yeah. interesting. No, no. no, no. So, so <laughs> one thing to think about is, uh, you know, 700,000 years ago to a couple of million years ago, whatever, 
on those timescales, there were multiple hominid species on the planet coexisting. And we know that, you know, whilst there were modern, Europe, uh, modern humans emerging from Africa, there were already um, Homo erectus, Neanderthals, Denisovians, and other human groups who have all gone extinct. And they were, they were distinct from us in certain ways. They had different features. Of course, we all know the stereotypical picture of what the Neanderthal looks like, but they also had different brain cases. They, so they probably thought somewhat differently about things. And I wonder if, you know, what humans would be like today if there was a distinct group of other humans. And um, uh, uh, have you read the Michael Crichton book, The 13th Warrior? I don't think so. Oh, okay. It's about an, an Arabian explorer who joins up with some Vikings to sail into deepest Russia. And they encounter the last of these people, and they're supposed to be like the last of the Neanderthals, right? And so, you know, and they are the, it, it, become, it becomes the, um, the Beowulf myth. They are the Grendel, is that the, the, we're the last of the Neanderthals. I saw the movie. Oh yeah, with Antonio Banderas. Uh, yeah, yeah, so, so you, you, know, you know there's that kind of story, but no, that, that happened, the, the, the last um, Neanderthal died prehistory. We don't have a record of them uh, what they were like. We have them in our DNA. We know that. But what would it be like if they were around today? Right? And what, what would, I mean, what would their view of the universe and all this stuff kind of be? Would it be the same as ours? Would it be different? Would they not care? Or would it, I, I don't know. I know it's one of those things that has puzzled me. And I, I, I probably we are here today in the state that we are because everybody else died out and we could get dominance, right? That's probably part of it. But it- Fortune. It, it, yeah, yes, yes. Uh, it is one of those really interesting hypotheticals that I wish, I, I, I wish I could visit the African savannah, you know, a couple of million years ago, just to see. And, you know, th there'll be different groups of proto-humans. Why was our group the one that came to dominate? We don't know. We don't know. I think we were more aggressive than all. <laughs> well, that's, it's kind of an interesting thing. So I, I read uh, a really interesting discussion of why it took us so long to leave Africa, right? Because we were in Africa for quite a while. And it was pointed out that Homo erectus had already left Africa and they were uh, very prominent in the Levant, okay? And maybe they didn't let us leave because they were more violent. Right, we we don't know. We we just we don't know what it what it was, but it, it it's such a big question. Anyway, so that was a complete tangent, and because I enjoy reading human evolution, and it's it's very insightful. <laughs> um, yeah, I, I mean uh, th th these are uh, important questions, uh, perhaps not immediately existential uh, for for people uh, in the world who now suffer at the hands of uh, of uh, of other people. Uh, but but I believe that this these these questions and this kind of discussion is what makes us uh, worthwhile. And then uh, the fortune of being here uh, isn't. Uh, 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 I don't know, a wasted gift, if we can call it so. Um, this is what uh, uh, makes us noble and uh, uh, really worthwhile, the fact that we can discuss such matters. Yes, how would uh, uh, other hominids think, dream? Uh, we, we know that they, they left uh, signs of, of, of a culture. They were able oh, yes. to, to paint. They were able to... Uh, um, uh, create tools and so on and so forth. And um, by all intents and purposes, their victories are somehow uh, alive uh, in us uh, yeah. because we, we also inherit their, uh, their genetic makeup. I don't know if, if there's any such thing as genetic memory, but uh, we are the product of, uh, of all their victories and um, defeats. Um, Thank you very much for another thought-provoking uh, uh, conversation, Geraint. Uh, it's uh, such a pleasure. Um, 
I, I learn a lot every time I, I uh, talk to you and I have to read that book, of course. <laughs> Thank you. So and look, it's always good to talk and, and sorry for my tangents, but I said the, the, the entire question of life, not only in the universe, but even on this planet, right? Even on this planet, it's something that you, you could spend hours pondering and I don't think you get any closer to solving some of the mysteries. That's the beauty of it. Yeah. Thank you once again. Thank you. Bye-bye.